Laura and I began talking about my painting practice in the summer of 2020. Over the next year, we would talk more about the work, uh, the work's ambitions, where it stood, and um, in a time when it feels important to know other people as well as my practice, these conversations have been incredibly important. Thanks. That was a really nice introduction, Alex. Uh, as I was thinking back and like how we started talking, like talking about Time and Intent, which is, uh, of course, the title of the show. Mm -hmm. I guess when I think about time, I do think a lot about this past year. Yes. And how your work is made like over the course of the past year. But then some of the works were made prior to the beginning of the pandemic and then some during the pandemic. I guess the notion of time in the this body of work and how, because I think that's something you are interested in, like how that notion has changed from the beginning of the year towards like midway through the year. Yeah. Time was something different for me before and maybe something that I attributed to value. You know, the more time I would spend on a painting, the yeah. more worthy it would be of being a capital P painting for myself. Yeah. And then when, you know, the pandemic happened and I was spending more of my time at home, also spending a lot of my time then online and interacting socially with people through, you know, my computer, my phone, like, you know, how we've met, things started to kind of shift in a way that like, you know, time really compressed. I would, you know, wake up in the morning and do everything that I usually would do. But I think the lack of movement in my day created this compression of time. And yes. it feels in a way like I will, when this is all quote unquote done, this pandemic is finished, I will go back to March 2020 and pick up my life where I left it off. Anyway, why don't we talk about the work? I'm curious, what were your first impressions of it? I was sort of reminded of quilting right. um, because of the patterning. And then because of that, and I was working on a quilt myself. And then I was thinking also about like language and quilting or patterns. And I feel that sort of like started a conversation that we, I feel like we've continued but never finished and uh, it's up to you where you want to start. Yeah, I think we can talk about, I think more than quilting, I, textiles definitely completely influence the patterns that I use. And I think most of them do come from textile designs from early 20th century design. But I think the conversation about language that we, I'm remembering it now that we had, I think has been more important conceptually for me and I think anything else over the entire time that I've I've made paintings or even work like I've always been interested in language and how language could be a pattern and written uh, words and the look of written words and how you know coding is also a written language but it's not necessarily the written language that we speak but it's more a more nuanced or maybe even ambiguous language that we are aware of but isn't spoken but is known right yeah now i'm also slowly remembering how i guess your uh some of your older work incorporated language and also how you made a lot of books and i think now if you if you or when i hear you talk about more conceptual a conceptual understanding of language. I was also thinking how within your work you talk, or I guess we both have talked a lot about the grit and yeah. even those words like grit, I feel like that's sort of, it also, I guess it's sort of reminiscent of the internet, which is also, you know, has these codes that are a language that are, you know, not necessarily language as we use to communicate like face to face with people, but, it becomes more of a pattern of signs, I guess, or of, right, um, yeah. yeah, when I, I guess I was also reading back one of the texts that you wrote about your work and you talk about the patterns as being a sentient force, which I thought was yeah. really interesting because then I, that somehow also reminded me of this conversation about language in a way, or like something that lives on its own. Like maybe you start a pattern, but that idea of repetition, it sort of creates a life of its of its own. 
I wanted, yeah, I wanted the work to kind of have its own agency and was wondering how could the pattern kind of grow on its own or continue on its own. And I think through this idea of like having the pattern and then putting a grid on top of it creates a way for, yeah, this like sentient, I mean, it's it's also a fantasy, this like sentient pattern, mm-hmm. right? Like that that this thing like will continue to grow, even though, I mean, I feel a little conflicted about the growing of the pattern on my painted surface because I also feel like at the same time that this is one object and what's happening on the surface is kind of uninterrupted it's just like that's where it's happening that's where it lives this is like the painted surface object and it kind of doesn't continue although I think some people would maybe disagree with me I feel very strongly that it's there there are interruptions inside or you know potential continuations off the edge of the canvas but that everything in there is happening. So maybe like the growing kind of like circles back into itself on the painted surface. Yeah, yeah, because I do think when I look at the works that I feel, yeah, there's, you know, where the canvas ends, the painting ends and the patterns, I mean, they don't continue onto the wall, but I do see that this sort of movement that is generated by that as a, I guess maybe as an idea, keeps moving beyond itself and I, and maybe also just in sort of thoughts that the idea of movement or of this repetition like ties into it. Um, like you've talked before also about like labor or mm-hmm. productivity. And I feel like those maybe an allusion to kind of these concepts allow for maybe a non-visual movement or repetition to go beyond the work or beyond the physical limits of the work, maybe. Right, like what I do... In making the painting, there's like a continuation of the labor. Yes. I feel like when you think about it, it's like maybe it goes, you know, from one place to from A to B. Could be from a left bottom corner to a right top corner if we speak about painting surfaces. But at the same, I feel like there's so many different directions possible because the pattern consists out of seemingly exactly the same shapes. They might all be slightly different because they're painted by hand by you. So they're unique while being a repetition. I mean, there's no way in telling like what the first one is and where the last one is. While being maybe diagonal or linear in a way, they're also very cyclical. And then simultaneously, as you can see really well in the paintings, when you go up close, like it's various layers of patterns and some of them go underneath another pattern for a little bit and they come back. Yeah, right. And then that, I mean, that makes sense in in terms of thinking about the quilting of it, like that it's not, I think sometimes when I think about quilting, I think about like the actual physical object and potentially how it's used or who, who makes it. But I think the verb of quilting, um, maybe it's like weaving is what is important for the work when we're talking about weaving Um, It reminds me of the painting external and internal objects. Um, And in that painting, I use the logo of the Wiener Werkstätte, which is a um, geometric representation of the flower. So the logo is um, inside of a grid square, and these grid squares cover the entire painted surface. And behind that grid square, there are these three silhouettes, portraits of this girl who has a ponytail. And I think that the relationship between them is there's this like identity of the the self or the person in relationship to this like branded identity. Yeah, it's. I feel like it's really interesting. It allows for a, a redefining or like changing of meaning of yeah. certain fixed meanings that are attached to certain shapes or logos in particular. I also think actually in using an existing logo that is known among certain people that it might also emphasize, because I feel like the shape of the girl with the ponytail, that's repeated in various of the paintings, whether it's the whole body or just the head. In the paintings, it also becomes a kind of logo or an icon, and but we might not recognize it directly as such because it's not an existing brand, you know, per se, or not in the way that perhaps this Wiener Werkstatt logo is. So I think it's using an existing logo alongside an icon like this 
girl, it also maybe emphasizes the possibility of, you know, redefining sort of the brand of what this girly hood means. And I really like that idea. And it made me think back about when you were talking about the flower as a, an object and it referring to both, you know, blooming as well as death. In a way, girls also, I guess, maybe refer more so to, you know, youth, but also it's like, I feel like the girls that you're painting and we've talked about this, they're like between, they're like adolescents, so they're like in transition somehow uh, from young girl into woman. And so not that this transition equals death, like, but I do think it's interesting that both flowers, like there's this- Maybe not death, but like loss. Life. Yeah, loss or or just- Change. I guess, or maybe change. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like that's what you're talking- because. I feel like maybe this ties in with the idea of movement mm -hmm. and sentience like vision right i like thinking about this like movement and change and the the language and i mean i'm looking all i'm looking again at we are aspiring and i'm thinking about like reading reading left to right um and then you're like you don't can't read left to right really i mean looking at this painting on a screen it's a little bit easier to do that but in person they they um definitely have a different impact i guess in terms of how you're looking or how one looks or how i look because i don't know how actually anyone else looks and i guess also these paintings feel a lot more logical to me than maybe potentially they are how do you mean logical like they follow a system for me like i can kind of know but it's because i've made them so like i know how they were made yeah. i know how i want them to be read for me i know how they you know i think by knowing how something's constructed or made you can kind of start to understand how to you can you start to understand it yeah we're sort of as viewers guided in a certain way too because they're like hung with this particular orientation versus upside down and so i feel like there even though it's hung one way maybe it could have be hung upside down and it's sort of the same but not the same mm -hmm. and so yeah I guess we're given sort of like a guidance on how to read them but I think that's the interesting thing thinking about how the change of meaning but also the change of like direction like we're sort of thinking like look and read whether that's like language or visual mm -hmm. from left to right and like from top to bottom but if you think about it like or look at these patterns which are kind of like they're the same seemingly at the bottom as they are at the top with within slight changes within each of the shapes because they're hand painted which I think we should talk about too because that's really interesting mm -hmm. to me but technically like the in any of the paintings whether we're talking about a pattern of like squares in the background or if it's the flowers or if it's the circles within the squares like each or any of them could be the starting point for the whole mm -hmm. or could be the one after which the others are made each one of them could be the first or the last for sure and i think that then for me comes back to this uh this weaving where things kind of i did want things to be more or less democratic all on one level or as much as possible but of course certain things stick out depending on how one reads it 